Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sam Dart. If you guys are new, make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on post notification bell, or leave a funny comment down below, leave a like. Today, I'm going to be going to do the Death Pro, the final 24 hours of Death Pro. Let's get this. What on earth did you guys do this for to get on Death Pro? You guys should not be doing stupid stuff like that. Period. You guys should be hanging out with the right crowd and hang out with the right people and stay out of trouble. Please, guys, stay out of trouble because this is terrible. 24 hours. You have to um, get some with your dream food that you ever wanted to eat. You have to eat it before you die, which is terrible. But you guys should not be hurting other people like that to get on death row. So let's get to this video and today I'm going to be going to my old school today because they're tearing it down and they're building up the new North High School. That's where I used to go to. I graduated 2012, six years ago. So let's go. I'll tell you all about it back, back later on. <coughs> Countdown. The final 24 hours to execution. Just don't simply get a man and walk him from his cell and execute him. The policy book prescribes a schedule hour by hour and even down to minute by minute. But executions don't always go according to the plan. His head caught on fire and his leg caught on fire. The needle was dangling there. It came out. That kind of was a messy deal. To the last meal. It won't take it long before old is his uh, stomach contents on autopsy report. There are not a lot of people who have the opportunity to actually see someone die. Inside accounts from the men who worked there reveal the last 24 hours on death row. It's routine for us. spent appealing against their sentence. If the appeals fail, the journey to the execution chamber begins here in the judge's office. What first occurs is the order. That sets the date. And then within 10 days, you sign what's called the warrant of execution. Dallas Judge Robert Francis has presided over five death penalty convictions. The warrant of execution authorizes that the person to be executed is supposed to be executed in a certain room, in a certain manner, at a certain day, to a certain time. Each state has a different protocol for execution because it's up to that state's legislature. There are five methods of execution in use today, and 14 states allow the prisoner to choose how he will be put to death. Today, inmates in Washington state can oh. choose hanging. Since 1776, more people have been executed by hanging than by any other method. The firing squad, most recently used in Utah in 2010. It's available to prisoners convicted there before 2004. Electrocution. Most executions in the 20th century used the electric chair. It's an option for inmates in Alabama, Florida, South Carolina, and Virginia. Lethal gas. Last used in Arizona in 1999, the gas chamber is still a choice for inmates in Missouri and California. And finally, lethal injection. First used in 1982, most executions in the past two decades have been by lethal injection. It is now the primary method of execution in all 33 death penalty states. Execution as a state sanctioned or state approved homicide. I remember signing the very first one. 
the first time I did it, that was the end of work that day. It is a, a strange feeling knowing that signature is required, that signature is yours. Once the death warrant is signed, the countdown to execution begins. You move the inmate from death row to the death chamber 24 hours before he's executed. Alan Ault conducted five executions as Commissioner of Corrections in Georgia. Come to the door to the street. The policy book prescribes a schedule hour by hour and even down to minute by minute. Go ahead and turn around, put your back towards the door. Everything you did with the inmate, everything you did in the execution chamber, the way you handled witnesses, the way you handled the victim's family. The routine that you went through was exactly the same. Each death penalty state conducts executions according to its own protocol and timeline. From 1967 through 1976, there were no executions in America, while legal challenges to the death penalty were considered. In 1977, executions resumed when convicted murderer Gary Gilmore faced a firing squad in Utah. Since then, Texas has conducted more executions than any other state. Their protocol has become a model for many others. Since we do so many executions in Texas, there's somewhat of being experts at it, I guess. Jim Willett was warden of Huntsville Prison, where all Texas death sentences are carried out. He oversaw 89 executions in three years there. Well, I don't know if you'd call it an executioner's school, but you've got these states out there that may not have done an execution in 10 years, and so they'll come here to see how we do it. Prior to leaving death row and getting on the van to come to the death house, the inmate would be searched really well. He'd want to search the inmate and make sure he doesn't have a weapon so that he uh, couldn't do damage to himself or commit suicide. The bottom line on execution is it's a court order. So anything other than an execution by the state would have not been acceptable per the court order. was a member of the Texas execution team at Huntsville Prison. He participated in 102 lethal injections. The execution team was viewed as somewhat an elite unit, primarily because of the uniqueness of the duty, the care, and the commitment that had to be brought to that duty. Also known as the tie-down team, it's composed of prison staff. No one is compelled to take part. Everyone that's involved is a volunteer. It just wasn't something that everyone was able to do, was comfortable doing. My first assignment was to go to death row, bring that mate back to the death house. In Texas, it's a 45-mile journey from death row at the Polunsky unit to the place of execution in Huntsville, known as the death house. Ready? Step. The drive is the most vulnerable part of the transfer. Transport process was probably the inmate's last chance of escape and probably the best chance he'd ever had to escape, assuming he had outside help. We didn't take it lightly. The three-vehicle convoy varies the route taken to avoid ambush. The atmosphere within the van was solemn. We all knew where we were going and why. It all contributed to the fact that nobody said a whole lot. The precautions work. In Texas, no one has ever escaped during transport to the death house. Once the inmate is escorted into the death house from the transport van, that'll be the last time he'll see the light of day.
Thanksgiving, Independence Day, Memorial Day. Holidays are a great time to riddle America. In the prison kitchens, the inmates' request for a last meal has been received. My name is Brian Price, and I am the death row chef. Brian Price was an inmate in Texas Huntsville Prison. I went to prison in 1989 on a 15-year sentence. And when you arrive in prison, they assign you a job. I was a musician and a photographer, and they told me, well, not any longer, now you're in the kitchen. While working in the Huntsville Unit kitchens, Brian prepared 189 last meals. Oh. During their last weeks on death row, the inmate would be given a last meal request, which I have here. Imagine what's going through their minds. This is my last meal on this earth. And I would start putting the ingredients together, whatever I was going to need on the day of the execution. I had to prepare it ahead of time if I could. Each state has its own rules about what a prisoner is allowed to request. In Florida, inmates can order food with a maximum cost of $40. In Oklahoma, the limit is $15. The death row inmates, they did not have a, a choice of whatever meal they were going to have every day. Here they have a, a choice. Something they haven't had probably in two decades. Once the inmates brought into the death house, cell door secured, it's not unsecured again until such time as it's time for the execution to take place. First thing I would see in the majority of them was fear. Fear of that place. That was death house. prisoner has been transferred from death row to a holding cell in the death house. There are 21 hours to execution. First person they would meet in the death house was me. Reverend Carol Pickett was chaplain at Texas Huntsville Unit. He was involved in 95 executions. <clears throat> First thing you would see is the, the majority of them was fear. Fear of that place. That was death house. The role of the chaplain is to provide comfort to the inmate. His role is to make sure this guy is prepared to die spiritually. I was to do anything and everything to help him face that last day Whatever it was, writing letters, making phone calls, singing songs, listening, listening, and listening. As night falls, the inmate can sleep if he wishes to. While in the death house, guards will keep a constant watch, ensuring he does not attempt suicide. On the morning of the day of execution, the equipment to be used in the death chamber may need to be tested. Lethal injection is carried out on a specially designed bed, or gurney. Prior to the execution, the staff would go in there to make sure that the straps were in good working order, that the phone to the governor's office was working and was in communication with the governor's office. The phone is needed because even on the day of execution, the inmate has a slim chance of avoiding death. reach the point that you got to the day of execution the defendant's attorneys are filing more motions and so forth the lawyers are feverishly trying to do something to get a study they're going to be out of the state system in the federal system they'll file them directly with the fifth circuit court once the fifth circuit court acts it's very rare that the supreme court takes any action beyond that uh, unless there's some new novel uh, worthy issue Unless an appeal succeeds, in the death house, preparations continue. For an electrocution, both the chair and its electrical components must be tested. Jerry Gibbons was Virginia's executioner from 1982 to 1999. He carried out 25 electrocutions. That will be the, the dummy and not the inmate's part, and it will scrap me in. And if I could kick my leg or move my leg, I would make sure that they tighten that. 
I didn't want my staff to get kicked in the face. The technology of electrocution has changed little since the first electric chair was used in 1890. This was the uh, Texas electric chair, dubbed Old Sparky by the inmates, and it was used first in 1924, and on the first night they used it, they electrocuted five men. The electric chairs are made of wood, so they will not conduct. The electricity will flow through a headpiece and a leg piece. This piece here was placed on the head, and there's another piece down here that would be placed on the left ankle. When connected to a power source, these will form a deadly circuit through the body of the inmate. I have a test board. It had 24 100 watt bulbs. And if one of those bulbs didn't light up, then we know we didn't have a good connection coming in, and that's how we used to test it. To ensure good electrical contact, the headpiece and leg piece are fitted with natural sponges soaked in salt water. The reason you use a real sponge is because when you soak the sponge in salt water, the sponge will expand and open up. So when the sponge expand and open up, the flow of electricity can come through. Lethal gas requires very careful preparation. The gas used hydrogen cyanide is poisonous and combustible the gas chamber was the most dangerous method of execution because gas does not discriminate about who it kills before every execution the seals on the gas chamber must be checked for potential leaks alan alt was responsible for the upkeep of gas chambers in mississippi and colorado i bought seals for the gas chamber i remember that cost 25000 in each place for the seals. Maintenance costs like these make lethal gas the most expensive form of execution. In California and Arizona, the chambers were designed to allow two inmates to be executed at the same time. To prepare for an execution by firing squad, marksmen must be recruited. In Utah in 2010, Convicted murderer Ronnie Lee Gardner chose this method, claiming he had lived by the gun, so he deserved to die by the gun. The Utah squad was composed of five law enforcement riflemen. Prager U, the best thinkers, presenting their best ideas in five. They used Winchester rifles. Four were loaded with 30 caliber ammunition. One was loaded with a blank. This way, the squad would not know who fired the fatal shots. Preparations for hanging have changed little in half a century. The most recent was in Delaware in 1996. Convicted murderer Billy Bailey chose hanging over lethal injection, saying, I'm not going to let them put me to sleep. Before the hanging, the rope was boiled and stretched. Bailey's weight was checked against a drop distance table developed by the U.S. Army in 1947. The heavier you were, the, of course, the less drop there would be. It would be more of an art than a science, even with the calculations and things of that nature. Um, of course, you would still have mistakes, and, you know, and the necks would get stretched out or the head would just pop off. In the death house cell, the prisoner is kept under constant surveillance as the clock counts down to execution. The inmate is going to get more privileges on his afternoon at the death house than he got during his years of stay on death row. The inmate will be allowed to shower, is allowed to use the phone. Whatever you want to do, we would dial the number for him. Allowed to complete his call. That last telephone call, you can't call anybody after that. From then on, the only person you're going to talk to is a chaplain. That was a very traumatic time. When they executed him, his hair fell apart, and he didn't die right away. In the death house, 
house. There are just four hours until execution. If the inmate has selected electrocution, his head may be shaved. Four hours prior to his execution, I will shave his head because the headpiece will fit right down on his head and I can get a good connection. Removing the hair removes a potential hazard. His head is shaved because in a case in Florida, when they executed him, his hair fell apart. In 1990, six-inch flames leapt from the head of convicted cop killer Jesse Tefero as he was electrocuted. Three jolts of power were required to kill him. He didn't die right away. It was a very obscene scene. <laughs> Florida's governor demanded an investigation into what went wrong. Experienced Virginia executioner Jerry Gibbons was flown to Florida to test their electric chair. I went to the prison and I examined the equipment. When I look at the, the headpiece and the leg piece, that's what the problem was. They had laced their head and leg piece with that synthetic rubber sponge. So when that leg switched to hit the guy, his head caught on fire and his leg caught on fire. The synthetic rubber sponge might have blocked the flow of electricity. Givens replaced it with a natural sponge. I did three or four tests. Then they had somebody from the court to witness the test. And then they reinstate the electrocutions for the state of Florida. Hair or cloth near the points of electrical contact adds to the risk of fire. To minimize this, the inmate's calf may also be shaved and a trouser leg cut off. Now, Huntsville inmate Brian Price would begin to cook the last meal. You had uh, two hours to prepare that meal and have it sent over to the death chamber. And, uh, you didn't, have, you couldn't make any mistakes because it was a one-time shot. Like I said, one time they burnt the chicken, it was just. Whew. The most requested last meal would be cheeseburgers and French fries. Believe it or not, sort of comfort food, I guess. Other infamous last meals like Timothy McVeigh, who was the bomber up in Oklahoma. He requested two pints of uh, mint chocolate chip ice cream. Serial killer Ted Bundy requested steak, eggs, hash browns, and coffee. John Wayne Gacy ordered a dozen deep fried oh, shrimp, a bucket of too. fried chicken, and a pound of strawberries. If I was in the inmate shoot, I would order cabbie off in the Black Sea and hope that they would take a long time to bring. I did everything I could to send it over there the way they wanted it. Of course, it won't take it long before all it is is uh, stomach contents on an autopsy report. Once, Brian was allowed to eat one of the last meals he had prepared. A condemned man had ordered four bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches. The man had tried to take his own life the night before. He'd been hoarding what we call tonguing uh, tranquilizer for several days where you put them under your tongue and you act like you, you swallow but you don't throw in the tongue you took them out and hit them and then he took them all at one time to try to cheat the executioner well they life flighted that man down the galveston to the prison hospital and pumped his stomach and brought him back to consciousness and then flew him back to the death house for his execution so my helper my friend and i uh, we ate those four bacon lettuce and tomato sandwiches which is my favorite sandwich by the way first one i had in 10 years in 2011 Texas ended the tradition of the last meal request. Now, inmates get whatever is being served in the prison that day. When the last meal is delivered to the inmate, he is uh, no more than two hours away from execution time. Joe! the prisoner eats his final meal, the men and women who will witness the execution begin to arrive at the prison. The role of the witnesses by law is to confirm that an individual was actually executed. So they witness the actual execution. People volunteer to do this. In many states, civilians with no connection to the crime must be present. In Texas, families of the victim have been allowed to attend since 1995. The inmate is also allowed to choose witnesses. 
the victim's witnesses and the inmates' witnesses are kept separate. They're never allowed to mingle. Other witnesses include representatives from the media. Probably I have seen more executions than any other person in the country. Houston journalist Michael Gratchik has covered more than 300 executions for the Associated Press. There are not a lot of people who have the opportunity to actually see someone die. We see dead bodies, but under these circumstances where you actually get to see someone breathe their last breath, uh, sure, it makes it, it can be difficult. Executions used to be conducted in public and anyone could attend. They would prepare food and stuff like that, and once the execution was completed, they would, you know, throw a little party. The last public execution was held in Owensboro, Kentucky, in 1936. It was watched by 10,000 people and widely criticized for its carnival spirit. After executions, violence would happen, and then it's like working up a mob. The largest number of witnesses since the Kentucky hanging was in 2001 for the execution of convicted Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh. 30 witnesses attended, and 250 relatives of the victims watched the lethal injection on closed circuit television. With one hour to go before the execution takes place, the executioner makes his way to the death chamber. The role of the executioner is absolutely the key part of the whole process. In Texas, the identity of the executioner is never officially disclosed. Whenever he'd walk across the recreation yard, go into the officer's dining room, everyone that he would pass, you could see them lean toward each other and go, he's alive. Yeah. In Florida, the job is carried out by a civilian who is paid $150. The role of the executioner is to make sure that the job is done correctly and precise as possible. The district attorney is the most important person in our criminal justice system. And most people don't know. It's the executioner who will administer the lethal injection, start the electrocution, or throw the switch which will mix the chemicals used in a gas chamber. <laughs> First thing that's going to catch his eye is that gurney, which is the place he's going to die. There are just 30 minutes to execution. In Texas, the warden comes to the death house with a five-man tie-down team. I looked him right in the eye, and I would call him by his last name, and I'd say, it's time to go with me to the next room. If the prisoner is not compliant, he will be carried to the death chamber. Every little tie-down team would suit up and use a force gear, which included helmet, chest pads, shin pads, elbow pads. The lead man would have a plastic shield. We were able to take control of the inmate have him on the gurney sometime within a minute. The vast majority of inmates present no resistance. Of the 89 inmates that I dealt with, I only have one that I would say was a problem and uh, hard to deal with. I would tell the inmate to follow me. I would turn my back to that inmate and walk him into the death chamber the long walk in the prison is maybe 10 feet it's not a long walk but that walk feel like a long walk even to us when the inmate walks into the death chamber it's going to be the first time he's seen that death chamber <laughs> The first thing that's going to catch his eye is that gurney, which is the place he's going to die. Once the death chamber is reached, he's advised to sit up on the gurney, then lie down on his back. 
Each member of the tie-down team is responsible for securing a part of the prisoner's body to the gurney. We would normally always have the same position. For example, I would be at the left arm and take care of the strap across the upper torso. Within 30 seconds, those officers would have all those straps, and there's a bunch of them. In a small room adjoining the death chamber, behind a one-way window, the executioner readies the drugs. Tubes lead from the executioner's room into the death chamber through a hole in the wall. Now, the medical team must insert them into the prisoner's veins. The American Medical Association advises doctors not to take part in executions because it is a violation of their code of ethics. In Texas, the tubes are inserted by a medical technician. It seems that when people get real nervous, sometimes those veins just kind of hunker down in there and don't pop up like they usually do. Some of them had burnt veins from drugs, which would make the injection process longer and much more painful. When the tubes are connected, a harmless saline solution begins to flow. The lethal drugs will not be administered until the inmate has said his last words. At that point, we're probably 15 minutes away, at most, from the execution. Even at this late stage, the inmate might receive a stay of execution. There's two phones in there, one connected to the governor and one connected to the attorney general. If any of those phones ring, everything stops. A stay might be given to allow a court more time to consider new submissions by the defense lawyers. On numerous occasions, the execution would be stayed, sometimes for an hour, sometimes for a day, and sometimes for a month. Convicted murderer James Autry was one of the first inmates scheduled to die by lethal injection in Texas in 1983. It was not on the journey two minutes before they were to start the process of killing him. He got to stay. So he was taken back to death row. No one on death row knew what to expect from the new method of execution. But Autry had been through more of the process than any prisoner alive. He told everybody exactly what took place, so there was no more secrets. James Autry was eventually executed in March 1984. More than 130 people have been wholly exonerated after being sentenced to death. Ronald Kiney is one of them. He was facing the gas chamber for a murder he was later acquitted of. This was my cell right here. We could talk in these vents up here, talk to the people upstairs. That was our telephone system. Shortly before Connie was due to be taken to the gas chamber, a prison official asked for his last request. I told him, right, here's my request. I said, when I'm in that chair, and they dropped that pill on me. Guest starts to come up, I want you to come in here and hold my hand. <laughs> then, new evidence came to light and Kiney's lawyers succeeded in proving his innocence. I'm to ask the lawyers, is this what this means? Does this mean we're done? We're done and everything? He says, yeah, you're done. You're going home. <laughs> Without the legal attention given to death row cases, Kiney might not be free today. If I was sentenced to life in prison, I would still be here. Nobody would have looked at the case. Lowered those glasses. It was time for the executioner to do what he had to do. There are 15 minutes until execution. The prisoner is restrained on the gurney. In Texas, the witnesses are now ushered into two viewing areas.
Associated Press journalist Michael Gratchik has witnessed hundreds of executions there. You hear people talk about uh, a seat in the death chamber. There are no chairs. You are allowed to bring in a pad and, and a writing implement, and that's it. Once the witnesses are brought into the room, I tell the inmate that he can make his last statement. Sorry for what I've done. To prevent delay, in Texas, the inmate is allowed a few minutes to make his final statement. California's protocol states that a brief final statement can be made. Kentucky imposes a two-minute limit. Pennsylvania allows only written statements. When the inmate has said his last words, he's probably looking at another couple of minutes of life. I would put my hand below their knee or on the ankle where I could feel a pulse. But they could feel it too. The warden would take his glasses off. When I lowered those glasses, it was time for the executioner to do what he had to do. Three states allow the use of one drug for lethal injection. Three states do not specify what procedure they use. All the other states, including Texas, specify three drugs in sequence. I will take the first drug, screw it in, and push it. The first drug is a barbiturate, which sedates the inmate. Occasionally the inmate will say, I can feel it, or, uh, you know, it, it's working. If the inmate has chosen electrocution, he will be strapped to a wooden chair. The headpiece and leg piece are attached. Some states also cover the face with a mask. It's routine for us. It takes a matter of seconds. In Virginia, the warden and chaplain remain in the death chamber. A signal is given, and the current switched on. When I give the order to execute, there's a real physical, violent jolt of the body. It would automatic run for 45 seconds on a high cycle. Protocols vary, but Givens would deliver two bursts of electricity at 2,400 volts and between two and four amps. You can actually hear the electricity, high voltage electricity going through the line. You can see the body swell and drop back. Then you will smell the flesh burning. It's, a, it's an awful, it's, it's an awful, greasy smell. And then the body is slumps. If I had a choice between electrocution and lethal injection, and if I was in that predicament, I would pick electrocution because I know it's faster. For execution by lethal gas, the prisoner is strapped into a wire mesh chair and the chamber sealed. When the signal is given, cyanide tablets are mixed with sulfuric acid inside the chamber. The gas produced is deadly hydrogen cyanide. There would be some moaning, gargling type noises severe shaking foaming of the mouth you're actually feeling like you're strangling to death once they actually uh, could no longer hold their breath the process would take four to seven minutes it's not a pleasant death liquid begins squirting toward me and you're thinking what if this gets on me yeah in the death chamber the inmate has made his final statement the warden has given the signal to execute him now lethal drugs flow into the prisoner's veins in minutes he should be dead but sometimes there is what's known as a blowout 
During the execution of convicted murderer Raymond Landry in Texas in 1988, the tubes came out of his arm. There was no glass that separated us from the inmate. And we're watching the inmate being put to death, and all of a sudden, I see this liquid begin squirting toward me. And you're thinking, what if this gets on me, you know? The medical team reinserted the tubes, and 14 minutes later, the execution continued. The next time I went into the chamber, they had put up the glass, and uh, that was the inauguration of uh, the glass that separated us from the inmate. There was a second Texas blowout in 1998 during the execution of convicted murderer Joseph Cannon. It was Jim Willett's first time in charge. The inmate turns his head towards me and he said it came out. And sure enough, the needle was dangling there. And so uh, that kind of was a messy deal. If there are no problems in the death chamber, the first drug sedates the inmate. Once the drug is completed through the line, I can see the flow going down the line. Then I will flush it with a saline solution. The saline flush is used because if the lethal drugs were to mix, solid particles might form and block the tubes. After the saline flush, the second drug, pancuronium bromide, is delivered. It will paralyze the inmate. As the drugs that take effect, their skin color begins turning almost crimson or purplish as the person is dying. I think if a fly will fly around in there, you can hear his wings flap. That's how quiet it is in there. The third drug, potassium chloride, stops the heart. I'm standing there and the pulse stops. For once, it feels like we don't have to go run a marathon to go find the church. The church is coming to us here. The execution is not officially complete until a medical doctor has checked the body for vital signs. He would do all those things that doctors do in order to be sure that someone's dead. He will look at a clock on the wall and give the time of death, and then we turn around and file out. If the inmate was executed using lethal gas, toxic residue is a real danger. The gas chamber is vented, and the team enters clad in protective suits. They would try to decontaminate the body by running their fingers through the hair, shaking off the clothing as much as possible to get as much of the, the powder itself off of the person. The electrical resistance of the human body causes it to heat up during electrocution. Afterwards, the corpse is left five minutes to cool before being removed. If no one claims the body, it will be buried the next day at the prison cemetery. When you see a grave, any grave, anywhere out there that has an X on it, that means he was executed. I remember the faces of the men I execute, and they appear in my nightmares. I guess for some people, it's easy, but it's, it, for me, it, was, it wasn't easy. I wasn't getting paid for this. I was doing it because this was the state of Virginia's head, too. You know, this is, this is the law gotten in trouble among death penalty opponents when I say that it's done with great dignity, but I think it is. I have no regret from having participated in the execution process. I always viewed it as a mandate from the court. We were the tools by which that order was carried out. So if you guys like this video, please give me a thumbs up, like, subscribe, and comment down below what other videos I should react to. Thank you guys for watching this awesome video. Uh, let's give this video a thumbs up, like, leave a friend comment down below. Make sure you turn that post notification bell on. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Bye.